Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I am your host, Whitney Sewell. Uh, today, our guest is John Cohen. Thanks for being on the show, John. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you for having me. Uh, John's a president of JC Property Group Incorporated. In 2013, did uh, over $3 million in real estate transactions. 2014, became a member of a group that closed $70 million in transactions. He's a graduate of Queens College with a degree in economics. And uh, John, would you give us a little more uh, background uh, maybe about yourself, how you got into real estate and specifically the syndication business. Sure. So I, uh, I actually started in finance as a uh, stockbroker um, when I got out of college. And then uh, after that, I realized yeah, I, didn't really, I didn't really like doing that. So uh, I actually just got my real estate license to become a residential broker uh, with the intent of always doing commercial real estate, um, I, but I wanted to start somewhere. So I just got my residential license and I started doing rentals and sales in Manhattan. Um, and then, you know, shortly after doing that, uh, I always wanted to do commercial. So then I started education, educating myself in the commercial space uh, and all the different various product types. And then uh, ended up going to Marcus and Chap, started doing investment sales, uh, multifamily investment sales in Ridgewood and Bushwick. Um, you know, with a hundred percent focus on the multifamily asset class. Awesome. So, so you, what was the way that you educate, started educating yourself that really helped you the most, you think? Uh, I would say uh, going on interviews, um, probably not the best answer, but yeah, you know, I remember the first interview I went on, I sat down with uh, uh, a guy and he said, you know, what, what do you want to do? And the answer was, I just want to sell uh, you know, I want to sell big buildings and make a lot of money. And, uh, <laughs> His response to me was that you, you got to do a little bit more research. He, you know, he said there, you know, there's multifamily industrial, um, you know, there's all different parts of the city. There's condo conversion, there's, an, uh, you know, retail office space, you know, a thousand different options. And uh, so I didn't really know. So I just, you know, kept, you know, had an interview scheduled. I sat down with a uh, guy, Marcus Millichap, my old manager, and he basically, you know, I told him what I wanted to do after doing a little bit more research, it was turn industrial space into condos in you know in the new york area and uh although it's profitable it takes a lot of time so he actually said you know if i could convince you that you can make as much money selling multifamily would that be of interest to you and of course i said yes um i was thinking selling you know two three four hundred unit buildings and we and you know it was ended up selling like six to eight units in uh bushwick ridgewood um Brooklyn and Queens. And uh, we ended up doing just as much business as you would do if you sold a, uh, you know, an industrial space for a condo conversion. So uh, I, the interview process was uh, just realizing when you sat down, having no idea how big that space actually is. Um, and there's so many different focuses. So it was just, you know, interviews after interviews, and then finally sitting down with the guy, Marcus and Millichap to really explain it and walk me through, you know, the steps that were needed to do each of those. And, uh, you know, ended up picking that job because I thought, you know, it gave me the most flexibility and freedom to do what I want. And I didn't have to necessarily work on a team or just sit there and be a paper pusher for a couple of years. So you answered it just a little bit, but so why multifamily, you know, as opposed to other commercial type properties and, and then why syndication also, you know, as opposed to starting a flipping business or, you know, single family homes, you're already in the residential, you know, why not growing a business there? So how did you land on multifamily and uh, syndication? Yeah. So multifamily, um, it, it was just a faster pace, uh, especially in Brooklyn and Queens. So because of the faster pace, I, it was an easy decision. Um, and then, you know, why I started investing in multifamily was, uh, just the security and the, the, the safety of the asset class. Uh, you know, simultaneously, you know, prior to all of this, uh, I owned 150 houses in Pennsylvania. I flipped a house, you know, a couple houses on Long Island. Um, you know, I bought all those house houses through tax auctions. Uh, it was great. It was fun. You know, we had a good time doing it, but, uh, multifamily was just something that it made more sense. I had the education and then I was a broker uh, or, you know, I was an agent selling them. So I understood it. I started talking to all my clients while I was doing that and trying to find out, you know, why they were doing it. What was the reason to do it? Uh, home line yards. And after all of that, 
um, after all of that, it, it just seemed to be the best option. Um, also, you know, just educating myself, speaking to, uh, speaking to, uh, you know, a ton of different people, um, you know, all my old clients, it was, uh, it was the easy decision for me. Awesome. So why don't you take us to your, your first syndication deal and kind of lay out a little bit about how you, how you completed that first syndication. How'd you make that happen? Um, yeah. So the first one was, uh, it was fun. So before, you know, once I got, you know, once I decided I wanted to, you know, leave the broker business, uh, you know, the agent business, uh, I just educated myself more on syndication, uh, you know, watching a ton of different videos and reading a ton of different books. And then, uh, you know, so one book, you know, it was a Dave Lindahl book, not uncommon to a lot of people in this business. Uh, it was, a, you know, some webinar and it said, send out direct mailers. So I did what I did in the single family world, what I did at Marcus and Millichap. Uh, I went to list source. I downloaded a list of, you know, you know, 25 to hundred unit properties in the Midwest. Um, and I just sent out a direct mailer to a ton of different people. And the, you know, that webinar said, you know, look for three families all next to each other, put one under contract and sell it to someone else that owns maybe three or four of those three families. Um, so I sent out a direct mail to, you know, a ton of different people. Uh, and I just did that process. I ended up getting someone to call me back on a 44 unit. So I, you know, I started talking to them and getting all the documents that were needed. And you know, simultaneously, a very good friend of mine, you know, like an uncle of mine, introduced me to, you know, who would be my mentor. Um, shortly thereafter. And after meeting him, I, I sort of really fine tuned the business and really started to focus on what I wanted to focus on. But it, the first deal I did come came from that direct mail campaign that I did launch. Uh, you know, I ended up, you know, it was a 48 unit in Columbus, Ohio, a distressed seller out of, uh, out of Hawaii who bought the property in 2007 or 2008. Um, actually, it was a little bit later than that, about 2000. He messed the entire deal up. Um, badly. And uh, it was a 70% occupied building. 50% of the tenants weren't even paying rent. Um, but that was the first one. And it came from a direct mail campaign just from, you know, doing regular market research and, uh, you know, watching a ton of different videos. Wow. So how did you, how did you structure that deal? And how did you, how did you raise capital, you know, from investors that being your first, your first one? So the first deal I did, you know, I did the, you know, the, while I was looking for deals, you know, two things that you always have to do in this business, it's, it's sourcing deals and sourcing equity. Um, you know, now I'm not an attorney by all means. So obviously when you source equity, you know, consult with your corporate attorney because there's a lot of things you can and can't do. But, uh, you know, I just went to the database. I picked up my cell phone and went from A to Z and just sort of writing down everybody that I knew or had a relationship with, you know, their name and a potential amount of money that I think they would have been able to uh, invest. And then, you know, I, I, I put together an email list. I emailed all of those individuals, um, sat down with all of them, coffees, lunch, dinners, you know, you name it, you know, had different events for them to come. And so they knew that I was an expert in that field. Uh, and then finally, once it came to raising money, then, you know, you put together an executive summary and then you got to ask for it. You know, nobody's gonna, you know, nobody's just going to say, Oh, here you go. Um, so I sent it out, uh, and basically said, you know, the minimum investment at that time, you know, I would take, you know, take anything from anybody. Uh, we're a little bit different now, but uh, it was, it was a mixture of all of that. It was just different events, talking to different people, networking, um, going out, you know, the million coffees. Uh, and then uh, basically just, you know, Hey, here's the deal. Here's the situation. Do you want to invest? Yes or no? Awesome. How did you present yourself as an expert, you know, considering it was your first syndication deal, or maybe you had taken on investors with, you know, with your other 150 single families, I'm not sure. But, you know, how did you present yourself as an expert considering you were just starting this venture? So uh, the, the, the hundred fit, the houses were really all myself. It was my own money, um, my brother, and you know, maybe a cousin or two. It was not full investor stuff. Uh, I presented myself as an expert and I think this is something that you know, everyone should do. You know, you have to educate your database of investors or potential investors before you have a deal. Um, they have to know who you are. So, you know, a lot of my investors, you know, I did have a couple of old clients from Marcus and Millichap that invested. Uh, and I had some friends uh, that knew what I've been doing for the last, let's call it five years at the time. Uh, you know, when I was a financial advisor from when I was a broker, from when I was a commercial broker to when I finally put this deal under contract. So they knew that I, you know, one, as a financial advisor, I've raised money before. They knew that I had a, you know, education in real estate from being a broker, from also being a commercial broker 
And then, you know, you have to put a spin on that. You know, you can't just go buy, you know, go to LoopNet and go buy a deal and, you know, wherever it is, you know, you got to pick some target markets. You know, I did identify Columbus as a market that I really liked. There was a lot of positive stuff going on. Um, and, you know, prior to that deal, it was an email once a month to my database saying, oh, look at this great article about Columbus. Look at the job growth about Columbus. So when they saw that, and they, you know, everything that, you know, I, I, the story that I built around myself, um, they bought in. And, you know, we had about, I think it was maybe about 12 or 13 investors in the first deal raised $580,000. Nice. So, you know, fast forwarding to maybe a deal you're working on now, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, your most recent deal, you know, what are some things that, that stand out that you wish you'd have known when you were completing that first deal? <laughs> so that, that's a good question. Cause I, you know, I actually joke about it, you know, partially uh, on that loan, uh, a buddy of mine helped me sign for the loan of my dad. And uh, you know, my buddy who signed, helped me sign for the loan, he invested 120 grand and also, um, signed the loan with me, you know, we're still friends today. We, you know, we partnered on a ton of deals, you know, we, I think the last four or five deals we've done, we partnered on. And, uh, we always joke about it because if we knew what we knew today on that deal, you know, now that deal we bought and sold, uh, it was about 18 months. Um, and we did phenomenal. It was you know, over a 40% return, uh, not 40, 40 IRR for the investor. So it was a, it was a great deal for them. Um, but if we knew what we knew today, that deal would have gone completely different and probably significantly better. Um, but, you know, what are, what are some of those things? You know, one, don't be afraid to fire a manager. You know, I think that's something that everybody has to do. Uh, I know we, in eight months into that deal, you know, I knew that we should have fired him. I spoke to my mentor. I spoke to a lot of people and they, and we were getting ready to sell it. So they basically said, you know, hold off. Don't, don't disrupt anything right now. Um, hindsight, I should have fired him, you know, 30 days after takeover, just, you know, the stories that nothing was going right, but don't be afraid to fire a manager. Um, two, uh, I think that, you know, when you put your deal on paper, you always want it to do better. Uh, you know, they, this, you do have to be a little bit patient. Uh, these deals do take time there. It's not a single family flip where you could go in, renovate the kitchen and sell it in 60 days, 90 days. Um, the, you're dealing with, you know, multiple tenants, multiple different personalities, um, you know, not only from your, your personalities of your investors, your personalities of uh, the, the manager, the personality of all the tenants. Um, so, and you got a lot of work to do. I mean, we spent, you know, we spent about 250 grand on the deal, you know, renovating it and, and fixing it and getting units online. There was down units. Uh, you have to manage contractors. So, uh, you know, as well as you want the deals to do and they, they, you know, they can do really well. Um, they just, you know, I always want it done yesterday. Uh, and you got to realize that some stuff takes a little bit longer. So you just got to have a, you know, a little bit more patience when you're doing the bigger deals. And then, uh, you know, managing contractors, you know, the first contractor on that property was fantastic. We hired him on another deal. Um, he ended up, a sad story, he ended up getting cancer and passing away, but then he passed off the deal to someone in his company, his boss, and his boss was you know, just the regular contractor stories amplified. Just, he was the worst human being in the world. Um, we ended up firing him right away, but, um, managing contractors, you know, from 2014 to today, we've gotten significantly better at. Nice. So, you know, in the syndication business, you know, what, what would you say is the hardest part? You know, is it raising capital? Is it finding deals or is it something else, you know, completely different for you? Um, so right now and today where we are in the market cycle, I would say the hardest thing today is, is good deals. Um, you can find a deal, right? But I don't know if it's a deal. Uh, the market is so, you know, we're closer to the top than we are to the bottom. So the hardest thing for us, and this comes from a broker who sources, you know, all our deals, um, myself, um, or a former broker, uh, finding deals, just finding good deals and just being patient. I mean, even more so today than ever before, uh, you know, we're underwriting a hundred, 150 deals before one makes sense. Whereas, you know, four or five years ago, you underwrote a deal, you know, you could get it to work by doing a little thing here or there, or, you know, maybe different type of debt, um, but the debt that's out there today, you know, there's still really good long-term agency debt. Um, there's a lot of bridge debt and sometimes these deals aren't checking off the agency boxes and they're falling into the bridge options and the bridge options are just, you know, to us, not the right, you know, for depending on the deal, cause we do have some bridge loans. We're closing a bridge loans, uh, shortly, you know, probably 30 days. Um, 
but it's it's the deals. It's a good deal. You know, I that's by far right now. You know, the money. If you have any track record, if you've done anything, you know, there's a ton of money in this business chasing opportunities. If you have a good deal, it'll get funded. But I would say by far the hardest thing today is really making sure you don't make a mistake buying a bad deal because there's nothing worse than a bad deal. What What's something you do to make certain you're buying a good deal? Um, Give us a couple, couple things you, you would suggest. So one, I don't take anything that a broker said, you know, in one ear out the other. Um, we underwrite all our own deals. Uh, I underwrite to a higher vacancy than I, I would bet my life that it's, you know, 90% of the country. Um, and it all has to work there. Uh, and then we also stress test the deal. So we'll look at, you know, what happened in 2008, nine and 10 and, and what happened to this market, what happened to this property. And we'll underwrite the deal for that situation. If the deal doesn't work there, we won't buy it. And that's, that, that's the, you know, yo shit, you know, for lack of a better term. But, uh, but no, we, you know, we, we are extremely conservative and selective. So, we, you know, we're very specific to what we want to buy. If it doesn't check off every box, we're not willing to, you know, we're not willing to give an inch. I think that's the biggest thing and the most important thing anyone can do to buy a good deal. Set your parameter up and don't bend, you know, especially today, you know, you know, three years ago. Yeah. We, you know, we, we, you know, we bought a deal in a market that maybe, you know, it, it, we, we wouldn't have bought in, but you know, the opportunity was right uh, today more than ever. I would say, you know, set up your parameters. If it doesn't check off that box, don't do it. And you know, it, it's harder. It's easier to say than it than to do because, you know, we've been doing this since 2014, you know, we have $250 million under management, 2,500 units. We know what works and what, doesn't work as well. So, you know, we're not going to go off and buy a deal that doesn't, you know, check off all those boxes. So it's a little bit easier, but, you know, I would say the biggest piece of information I give anyone is, you know, double check it, put, you know, have someone else look at it. Don't, don't just, you know, underwrite a deal and, and yeah, this is the deal that I want to buy. If it hits your returns, your thresholds, your everything, just have one more set of eyes, take a look at it, whether it's, you know, a family member, a friend, a mentor, a broker, it doesn't matter who, just have someone else look at it to maybe pick up something that you may have missed. Give us a, cu a couple of the most important boxes that a deal has to check off on before you all will proceed. So in today's market, you know, we're looking for really big disasters. Like we're closing today on a 121 unit vacant deal in Columbus, Ohio. Um, it's in an opportunity zone. Not that that per se matters, but uh, we're buying it for seven a door. So yeah, you really can't mess that one up. Um, they've already messed it up. So it's got to be a really, really, really banged up disaster that we know we can go in, renovate it, fix it, and have a good basis. Or the other side of it, it's got to be a long-term owner that's owned it for more than five, you know, really more than eight years, but we will look at stuff more than five. Uh, it's got to be long-term owner. It's got to be, you know, in the vintage that we buy, which is, you know, 1970 to 1990. It's got to be in one of our seven target markets. Um, and that's a list that we're still whittling down. You know, we have four that we really like, but we've, we've, you know, we're not, we're, we're opportunistic in certain areas, but for the most part, we have target markets that we've picked and we're not going to deviate for them, especially through this time. Now uh, it's got to be sub 250 units. Uh, you know, we own a 400 unit, we own a 300 unit, uh, we own a 250 unit, but uh, you know, going forward, going into this next couple of years or, you know, 18 months, you know, we're trying to target, you know, long-term owners, more mom and pop style, um, where we see that we could come in right with our management team and really uh, implement a management plan right away. And then simultaneously with an interior, exterior uh, rebranding, we could bring the property to the next level. But for the most part for us, long-term owner, um, not purchased in the last five years because a lot of these deals have been bought by syndicators that have no idea what they're doing and the markets help them and they've only made it worse or they've renovated, you know, 10 units on a 300 unit and they, Oh, it's a proven value add. We're not buying any of that stuff. We're buying stuff that's been untouched or not touched and uh, where well, we could go in and do what we want to do to it. So earlier you mentioned uh, agency debt, bridge debt, bridge loan, and something you all are in the middle of now for our listener who's, who's never heard of those terms before. Could you just elaborate a little bit on what that, what that means? What, what does yeah. agency and bridge debt mean? Yeah, so agency loans, that's your Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, products. You know, that's your fixed rate, 7, 10, 12. Um, they even have 35-year HUD loans. Uh, but, but that's your fixed rate 
five, seven, 10, 12 year debt. It's amortized over 30 years. Uh, you have a fixed interest rate that doesn't change. Um, and you could buy it, hold it, and, and you have less risk in my opinion. The bridge debt, that's the stuff that's the floating rate loans. It's higher leverage. So an agency loan uh, from Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae will be 70, 75%. You could go as low as 50%. You can go as, you're not really seeing 80 right now. Some, you, you can, but you'll get, you know, 65 to 75% loan to value. Your bridge debt will be the high octane stuff. That'll go up to 85% of total capital, not just purchase price. That'll be, you know, a floating rate loan somewhere in the, you know, let's call it five to eight, if not higher range. Um, and that stuff, it, it, it floats. So as typically, there's a lot of difference, but it typically floats with the 30-day LIBOR, whatever 30-day LIBOR is, there's a spread over that and your rate will float. So as rates go up, your rate goes up uh, and there'll be shorter terms, 24 months, 36 months, they'll have extension options. Um, so they're just a little bit more risky because if we're coming to the end of the cycle and that could be in 24 months, it could be in 36 months, I don't know. Um, but it, it, we're coming to the end of the cycle. So, you know, if you're stuck in a loan that's high octane, a lot of leverage with a floating rate loan, as rates go up, which they're going up, your rates can become more expensive. The deal will be harder to, to get out of because you have a higher leverage on it. You have higher, you have higher leverage. So to, when you refinance that deal, you're going to need more proceeds. And, you know, who knows when cap rates will start going the other way, but at some point, you know, you may not be able to refinance out of those deals uh, in the future. So we're okay with them. We typically do a little bit of a lower leverage bridge, but, uh, but um, yeah, that's the major difference. One's a little bit more high octane, high leverage. The other one's a little bit more stable, you know, sit back bridge. You'll, you can, you can finance a, a vacant deal. You can finance a 70% occupied deal agency. They're going to want to see a 90% occupancy for, you know, a little bit of time. So what would you say is the top reason most syndicators fail? Perseverance. Uh, you, you know, it, by far, just you're going to get an ungodly amount of no's before you get a yes. Uh, and the thing I tell people all the time, and, you know, I actually have a, you know, kind of a coffee with, you know, with a younger person in the business coming up today uh, or trying to get into the business is, you know, when you stop sending out your direct mail or when you stop picking up the phone calling, you got to remember there's someone like myself, someone, you know, someone like anyone in this business that may, that their call may be your call that you stopped on. Uh, people fail because they just don't, you know, they don't, timing and, and their timing is, you know, you know, I've been doing this for six months, shiny object syndrome. I'm on to the next day. I'm going to go buy, you know, notes or something, uh, you know, stick to it, focus on it, you know, network, you know, a podcast like this, you know, listen to all of them, you know, try and reach out to the people on the show, the guest and the host and just don't, don't stop, you know, and it, even if it means investing in somebody's deal that you trust and know, it, it'll give you a little bit more motivation to try and go find your own. So I tell people all the time, just, you know, the thing, the reason why people fail is that they, well, forgetting the fact that they buy a bad deal and mess it up. Right. Not, not that, but uh, just, you know, not, they don't get started. You know, get started either if it's a, just invest in a deal to keep, you know, keep the momentum going or um, you know, just don't stop, you know, call another broker, call another owner, you know, just keep, keep it going. Would you say uh, perseverance is the, the thing that's contributed to your success or the biggest thing or, or would you yeah. be able to add to that? Yeah, no, I would say yes. Cause you know, you know, we didn't, you know, it wasn't like the first deal we sent out, we bought, um, you know, like that direct mail, I sent out seven direct mail campaigns. Um, that just happened to be in one uh, and, and it didn't even go directly to the owner. It actually hit, the owner had all his mail forwarded to the manager. Uh, the manager was moving offices and I had called him, uh, someone introduced me to him. And uh, he picked up the phone and called me and said, Hey, I got four of your letters on the desk. I'm like, I have a perfect deal for you. Let me introduce you to the owner. Uh, and that's something you're probably not going to you know, read in the book, you know, you know, direct, direct mail managers, call managers, go into markets. Uh, we did all of that. You know, we find a market, we go into the market. I, I try and at least visually look at, you know, 200 plus properties in that market before we go forward. Um, you know, I, I want to know the story with everything. Uh, you know, I want to know everything that's going on. I want to talk to the, the, the residents. I want to talk to the owners of deals that I'm not buying. You know, you know, when a broker blasts the deal out, you know, when he puts the comps in there, okay, call all those comps, uh, you know, simultaneously, you know, go on apartments.com, look up the property and call all the properties around it. Find out if the broker story is accurate and most people do it. 
but they stop, you know, they'll do it to two or three properties, you know, don't stop there because two or three may give you the answer you want, but eight of them that you didn't call may not. So it's just the full, the full gamut. But yeah, I would say uh, that that's been the biggest, you know, success to me because I'm not the smartest guy in the world. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm none of that. You know, I'm, I just, you know, I'll just, I'll just pick up the phone, make another call, you know, wake up a little earlier, go to bed a little later. Awesome. That's a great answer. Um, so before we have to go, uh, what's some way that, that you all are improving your business right now that we can all apply to our businesses? Asset management. Um, by far, I would say that the number one thing that we're doing is really going through our systems and getting our asset management down. Cause in a time when the market does correct itself or goes the other way, um, in, in my opinion, uh, you're going to have to really, get into the business. You can't just, you know, rely on a third party manager to do it. Um, they won't do it well. So, you know, the two things, asset management and the other thing that we're looking, I would say we have an 18 month, give or take 18 month window, 24 months. Uh, we are going to vertically integrate our whole business. So we're going to have everything in house, you know, from, you know, hopefully from renovation to, to management, we're going to try and do it all ourself because then you have physical control and I know that goes against what a lot of people say you know hiring third-party management uh, we're not using it you know we're not starting a management company to be a profit center we're starting a management you know we're, we're gonna manage our own deals to do a better job um, but I would say by far the thing that we're doing is asset management just getting our investor relations better uh, which you can never be too good at and, uh, you know, management, the management side of this business, this business is 100% based on the people that you have on site and, and your ability to manage them. So, you know, that's the system that we're always, um, always looking to build out better. Awesome. John, you've been a great guest and I really appreciate you being on the show. Would you tell the listeners how they can learn more about you and your company? Yeah. So, uh, you know, JC Property Group was, uh, yeah, that's my company. Um, our investment business is Toro Real Estate Partners. Uh, so you could reach out to me either uh, at John, and I know you, you'll probably send out my email address, either John at jcpropertygroupinc.com or our investment business is John at Toro, T-O-R-O-R-E-P.com. Um, and you can go to the, either website, the office numbers on the website. Um, you know, it, I'm very easy to reach out. You shoot me an email. Uh, or leave a voicemail at the office if I don't pick up because I'm traveling all the time. Uh, I will typically get back to anybody within 24 to 48 hours, you know, grab a cup of coffee, sit down, give anyone 30, 40 minutes just to, you know, find out you know, anything I can do to help. Awesome. Thank you so much, John, for being on the show. And I appreciate the listeners for uh, listening in today. I hope you will uh, leave a rating and review and subscribe. And I also hope you'll uh, join on the Facebook group. And so you can interact with the guests and ask questions. And so we can all learn, learn this business together. Uh, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.